Thank you, Professor Zoya Hassan, friends. I speak with great nervousness because I'm neither a Gandhian nor am I a Gandhi scholar. Uh, what I do believe I have discovered in some of Gandhi's writings is a deep insight into the problem of unemployment of a kind that you do not often find among professional economists and you also do not find among many of his or, or, or almost all his contemporary writers in India. Uh, now that interests me as an economist. Gandhi relates, for instance, the issue of unemployment to capitalism, which he doesn't call capitalism, uh, but at the same time, he also sees the link between unemployment and poverty. These are questions which to this day, professional economists shy away from or provide false answers to. So uh, that interests me in Gandhi and of course needless to say, since Gandhi was not writing a tome on, on unemployment, he was not a professional economist. He, what I would be talking about is really in some sense reading into Gandhi a set of ideas which are there in my view implicitly, but on the other hand I would be reading into Gandhi a, 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 a certain vision, a certain perspective. Uh, it's perfectly possible that one can look at other writings of Gandhi where he may well be contradicting what I am saying, but that is something which does not deter me because I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in <laughs> developing by culling out of Gandhi a certain vision on technology and employment, which I think is of great relevance to this day. Now, I believe that as a conceptual starting point for looking at Gandhi's views on unemployment, consider a set of petty producers, peasants, artisans, and so on, who are engaged in a process of simple reproduction or growth is taking place in a village community. Now, in such a world, there is no reason why there should be any unemployment because one person's product is in fact demanded and consumed by the other person. There is an exchange taking place amongst them and there's no obvious reason why there should be any unemployment. It is true that if such a simple village economy is a money-using economy, in that case it's perfectly possible that some people may decide to postpone their purchases of goods and hold on to money for some time. And in that case, even though we are in a very simple world, we can you know, see, visualize in such a world what later has come to be known as Keynesian unemployment. Because if people hold on to money, then there is a corresponding reduction in the demand for goods. Stocks of these goods pile up. And if stocks pile up, then there may be a reduction in the production of these goods. Therefore, there would be some unemployment or, as Gandhi would have put it, enforced idleness. So it's, it's conceivable that the introduction of money even into a world of simple commodity production of this kind is something which can generate unemployment, but there's no obvious reason. And this is something which Marx would have talk, talked of in terms of a CMC circuit and a break in the CMC circuit because between the first C and M and M and the second C, people decide to hold on to money for a much longer period than they otherwise would have done. Now, there is no reason, however, why they should decide to do that. And consequently, even though it's logically possible that you can have unemployment in such a world, it is unlikely. In fact, such a world would typically not be characterized by any kind of unemployment. Unemployment would arise in such a world if now suddenly you find that there are outside goods coming in and some of the persons in that community decide to buy outside goods instead of local goods. And in lieu of the outside goods which they buy, they actually sell their own goods which they would otherwise have sold to those whose goods they are now not buying. 
In that case, obviously, you would find that the group of people from whom demand has shifted to the outside goods would now find that their goods are, are unsaleable and consequently there would be unemployment. Now this unemployment is something which can be called unemployment because of a failure to exchange. There are a group of petty producers who suddenly find that it is not possible for them, that it's, 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 it's impossible for them to actually exchange what they have produced because the exchange is taking place along very different lines. Now this, of course, is the reason why there is unemployment at all. And of course, the outside in this case that Gandhi was talking about was really the metropolis. Metropolitan goods coming into the economy of the Indian village where a group of petty producers, peasants, now buy not the locally produced goods, but they buy the goods imported from abroad. And typically these are machine-made goods and that of course generates domestic unemployment. I think we should distinguish between two logical possibilities here. That it so happened that in the colonial situation, unemployment of this kind was because of imported machine-made goods. But suppose the machine-made goods had not been imported. Suppose they had been locally produced. Even then there would have been an unemployment because suppose you have 100 uh, petty producers producing 100 units of goods, but now suddenly you find that because of machine-made goods coming into the picture, only 50 people are required to produce the 100 goods. Then, of course, out of the 100 petty producers who are displaced, 50 may get absorbed as workers uh, employed along with machines, but the other 50 would not be absorbed. So technological unemployment is really a particular case of what I called earlier unemployment as failure to exchange. And I think Gandhi's recognition of technological unemployment is something which uh, I, I believe is extremely important. I believe it's important because oddly enough, despite the fact that you have had working class movements, the Luddites for instance, real working class struggles <coughs> against the introduction of machinery. Technological unemployment has really not been recognized much in the entire discipline of economics. The David Ricardo, the well-known classical economist, uh, whom Marx actually took as his point of departure for his analysis, did not recognize technological unemployment for quite some time. Finally, he did recognize technological unemployment in volume three of his, or edition three of his um, Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, in which he said, look, I'm sorry, until now, I, I didn't have an idea that there could be technological unemployment, but now I stand corrected. And he put forward an argument that went as follows. The argument was, that suppose you have the introduction of machinery, then obviously, precisely for reasons I'm talking about, there would be immediately some unemployment. But labor productivity rises, but real wages do not rise, and consequently, the profits increase, the rate of profit increases, the share of profit increases, and therefore the rate of accumulation increases, and therefore the rate of growth of output and the rate of growth of employment increases. As a result, the introduction of machinery, while it may immediately generate unemployment, over a period of time puts you on a path on which employment is growing faster than would have been the case otherwise and therefore after some time you not only catch up with what employment would have been in the absence of machinery but overtake it so that you know the introduction of machinery is something according to david ricardo which was uh, inimical to the working class in the short run is not so in the long run Ricardo's argument, of course, was criticized by Marx on two basic grounds. The first ground is that the whole question of demand does not enter the picture. Machinery may in fact produce uh, through larger um, 
labor productivity, a larger amount of output, uh, or even the same output with smaller amount of, of, of labor. But if these profits increase, Ricardo's assumption is that the profits are automatically invested. It could well be that if there are demand problems, these profits may not get invested, in which case the rate of accumulation would not necessarily become any higher because the rate of profit is higher, in which case there's no question of overtaking. Marx's second argument was that, look, Ricardo is talking about a one-shot introduction of machinery. But if you have a series of introductions of machinery, so that we have what you call technological progress, not just a one-shot introduction of machinery, in that case, it's not clear that actually the workers displaced by machines would ever get, get absorbed. Now, I think... The Ricardian argument, even if we completely ignore Marx's criticisms of this argument, even if we accept the Ricardian argument in toto, even then is something which is not valid in a colonial context. Because even assuming that because of workers getting displaced here, you actually have a rise in the rate of profit which occurs. This rise in the rate of profit, even if it gives rise to a higher rate of accumulation, it, it, the accumulation occurs in the metropolis. The accumulation doesn't occur here. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, what you find is that labor is not allowed to migrate, unemployed labor is not allowed to migrate from the colony to the metropolis. On the other hand, capital, which could, if it so wished, come and invest in the metropolis, in, in the colony from the metropolis, does not do so. It came only to things like minings and mines and plantations and so on, but not <coughs> generally. Then you find that even if there is unemployment that occurs in the colony, this unemployment, even if, even if Ricardo is right, this unemployment never gets appropriated through, uh, I mean, never gets exhausted through absorption or appropriation of these uh, unemployed into the workforce under capitalism. Now, therefore, in a colonial context, you actually find that the import of machine-made goods is necessarily associated with the creation of unemployment. Gandhi had no doubts at all that the creation of unemployment goes hand in hand with the intensification of poverty. The mass poverty he attributed to unemployment. Now this again is something which to, mo to, to, to most would actually appear to be a fairly obvious phenomenon, but I must say other than the Gandhian and the Marxist traditions, the association of unemployment with poverty is very rare in economics. The entire tradition of mainstream economics, including, for instance, what the IMF and the World Bank and so on theorize, is that poverty is because of low level of skills. That basically people are poor because they're not skilled. Therefore, it's a supply side approach to poverty, while uh, within the Marxist tradition, poverty is, of course, always associated with uh, the existence of unemployment. And interestingly, <coughs> Gandhi actually falls exactly into the same um, into the same um, pattern. I mean, you know, he also associates poverty with um, unemployment. Uh, I'll just read out a sentence from Gandhi. It's my conviction that India is a house on fire because its manhood is being daily scorned. It's dying of hunger because it has no work to buy food with. Hulna is starving not because uh, the people cannot work, but because they have no work. The seeded districts are passing successively through a fourth famine. Orissa is a land suffering from chronic famines. He associated famines, he associated uh, the existence of poverty, uh, hunger, with the existence of unemployment. And of course, he associated unemployment with the import of machine-made goods. Now, from this analysis of uh, unemployment and poverty, Gandhi's conclusion was fairly straightforward. The conclusion was that we have to re-establish exchange within the village community. Now, this is something, interestingly, he does not suggest 
uh, for it either protection, which is what a modern day economist would, uh, nor does he suggest for it uh, that there should be a ban on foreign goods, but what he suggests instead is a voluntary shunning of foreign goods. Now this voluntary shunning of foreign goods is something which, you know, um, obviously uh, would, if it is the case that within the village community where the fact that some people decided to buy goods from abroad rather than locally produced goods was the cause of local unemployment, if they stop buying foreign goods, then naturally you would have a revival of demand and revival of, of employment locally. Uh, but on the other hand, Gandhi's argument is not just that the shunning of foreign goods is a good thing per se, that the idea for buying local is not just that, you know, uh, I should be charitable to my neighbor. It is not just an ethical act which enriches me. But I think, while it is certainly an ethical act, but I think there is something more to his understanding there in my mind, and that is the fact that bu the buying locally is a way of re-establishing the community. And re-establishment of the community is a way of overcoming the colonization of the mind which he saw as underlying colon colonialism. Therefore, he had a vision of overcoming colonialism, which consisted not just in political independence, which consisted certainly not in high rates of growth like these days uh, we, 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 we emphasize, but it actually consisted in ridding your mind from the state of being colonized. And this required a degree of empathy with your fellow beings, and empathy that was the, that was the beginning of the re-establishment, reconstitution of the village community. Of course, Gandhi was very firm that the village community could not be reconstituted exactly on its old basis. I mean, he was totally opposed to untouchability, and therefore all these evil practices had to go. But on the other hand, reading the community of these evil practices, we had to reconstitute it because that was, because the, the destruction of the community is the obverse of the colonization of the mind. I think that was a very crucial consideration. Now in this, let me see if I can get another quotation from Gandhi. Yes, it is sinful to buy American wheat and let my neighbor, the grain dealer, starve for want of custom. Similarly, it is sinful for me to buy the latest finery of Regent Street, when I know that if I had but worn the things woven by the neighboring spinners and weavers, that would have clothed me and fed and clothed him, or clothed them. On the knowledge of my sin bursting upon me, I must confine the foreign garments, consign the foreign garments to the flame and thus purify myself and thenceforth rest content with the rough khadi made by my neighbors. On knowing that my neighbors may not, having given up the occupation, take kindly to the spinning wheel, I must take it up myself and thus make it popular. Now, while the entire conception is expressed in the language of sin and purity, really speaking, what he is saying is that my welfare is not independent of the welfare of my neighbor. And consequently, it is if my welfare becomes dependent on the welfare of my neighbor, then that is the beginning of a sense of community. And therefore, the argument is that I must reconstitute this feeling, this, 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 this empathy with my neighbors as a part of the sense of community. Now, this is something which, for instance, figured very largely in the Gandhi-Tagore debate. Tagore's argument, which was of course expressed in his writings as well as in his classic novel, Ghore Bairi, was that, look, foreign cloth is superior to what is being woven locally. As a result, as far as the peasants are concerned, 
from the peasant's point of view, buying foreign cloth is really an improvement in their standard of living. If you ask the peasant to get rid of foreign cloth and to buy locally instead, then there is a reduction in the peasant's welfare, that actually the peasant is becoming worse off as a result. In particular, of course, Tagore was very sensitive that in a situation like Bengal, where the bulk of the peasantry was Muslim, uh, the Swadeshi movement was led largely by upper caste Hindus, that this had a very strong communal dimension. Uh, but on the other hand, Gandhi's answer to that was that basically this talk about my welfare getting reduced if I buy locally is something which I reject because my welfare is not independent of the welfare of my neighbor. And if so, in that case, I cannot really simply be oblivious to what is happening to my neighbor and uh, that is something which, 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 which therefore must enter into my picture or, or into my conception of my own well-being. My own well-being includes the well-being of all my neighbors. This was an argument, as I said, which was not just for uh, increasing local employment, not just reducing local poverty, not just a question of charity or, 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 or anything of that kind, but above all, it was an argument for reviving a sense of community. Now, it's quite interesting that, that, that both the Marxist tradition as well as the Gandhian tradition emphasize this idea of liberation consisting in the revival of a community. Now, of course, the nature of the community that Marxists are talking about, the nature of the community that, that, that Gandhi was talking about are completely different. But on the other hand, this idea that liberation consists in the revival of a notion of community and that enslavement actually in Gandhi's conception began with the destruction of this community is a very powerful idea. I think this idea of colonization of the mind is something which uh, I think Gandhi shares with Fanon because in the entire third world there are very few writers, very, very few writers who have a perception of imperialism and colonialism as deep as either Fanon or Gandhi had. And there is something in common between Gandhi's talking about, as I just read out, purifying myself by consigning my clothes to the flame and Fanon's idea that when I actually shoot my white oppressor, I'm killing two persons at the same time, my oppressor as well as the suppressed me, as well as, 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 the, as, 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 as the me who all this time has really been colonized. So there is something about, you know, violence in Gandhi's case done to cloth, but in Fanon's case actual resort to violence as a way of, 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 of liberation and this is being particularly true in a situation where colonialism implies colonization of the mind is really a common feature. At any rate, I cannot think of anybody else in the 19th century or in, in the 1920 centuries who actually had as deep a perception and understanding of colonialism as either Gandhi or Fanon had. Now I think of course both Gandhi and Tagore agreed on the fact, they agreed on the fact that the peasant buying local cloth as opposed to foreign cloth would certainly mean the peasant uh, being in a material sense worse off. Tagore's idea was that, okay, therefore the peasant should, be, should actually buy foreign cloth. Gandhi's idea was that, no, even if the peasant, even if the fineries of the Regent Street are not worn by me, he is not disputing that Regent Street produces fineries. But even if the fineries of Regent Street are not worn by me, that should not worry me because my welfare is not independent of the welfare of somebody else. So, so, so the point is that both of them are agreed, if you like, in an ordering of the quality of the clause. Or, or, you know. uh, but on the other hand, uh, 
and therefore both of them are uh, I mean Gandhi's notion of the reconstitution of the community is one which suggests a transcendence of considerations of materially being better off but on the other hand when you actually look at it I think this is one point where both Gandhi and Tagore do not appear to have been correct because what happens is the following if you have de-industrialization, if you have unemployment, technological unemployment being generated, this increases the pressure of population on land, which it did. Therefore, it lowers the level of real wages. Therefore, it raises the level of rents. And therefore, the peasants are ultimately worse off. Because to say that the peasants are better off is to imagine that their income remains unchanged. But as a matter of fact, once you take their income itself being influenced by what is happening to the artisan population, the artisan population being thrown onto the land lowers the peasant's income, then you find that there is a commonality of interest even in material terms between the peasant and the artisan. If the artisan is unemployed, then the peasant's income drops. And as a matter of fact, historians have pointed out, and Bipin Chandra pointed it out, that through the late 19th century, because of the industrialization, you actually found a lowering of real wages in rural India, and you also found an increase in rents. So, really speaking, the only people who ultimately benefit, so, 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 so the peasants who appear to benefit in the short run, actually over a period of time, are become worse off because of the fact that their incomes begin to drop. The people who really benefit are on the one hand the kind of you know urban middlemen, if you like. I mean, you know, the, 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 the set of you know the urban class that is engaged in colonial trade, and of course the rural landlords, because as far as the landlords are concerned, not only do they have access to machine-made goods, which are of better quality and cheaper, but what is more, their incomes also go up because the rents have gone up. So on the whole, you find the de-industrialization, which Tagore thought would actually, was improving, and it was in, 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 in the short run, the conditions or the material conditions of the peasantry over a period of time actually worsen it. So it would follow from this perspective that as a matter of fact, there is a material basis to the sense of community that can be recreated. Now this material basis, of course, was developed particularly in the, in the, in, in the Marxist literature, where the idea was that you can actually have a worker-peasant alliance and the creation of a community now has to occur at a higher level of material production beyond capitalism. So if, if, if you like, the, 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 while there is a certain commonality of perspective between the Marxist and Gandhian traditions about the generation of unemployment in, in colonial countries, about the fact of um, uh, association of poverty and unemployment, about the destruction of the old community. Gandhi's panacea for unemployment and poverty is a revival of the old community. Well, the Marxist panacea would be that actually to create a new order in which you can have a worker-peasant alliance building uh, or going on to a building of socialism. Um, but as I said, the idea of development of a certain community as and as as a, as a, as, a, as a feature of liberation is something which is common to both the traditions. Now, I think one can then ask the question that all right, the Gandhian tradition or the, or the Gandhian conception of a return to the old village community, a revival of the old village community is something which of course could not withstand the spontaneity of capitalism. Capitalism is a spontaneous system, it's a self-driven system, it's a system that does not depend on the will and, and, and consciousness of individuals, it actually operates as an inexorable uh, uh, force driven by its own in, uh, driven by its own inner logic and manifesting itself in certain tendencies that are imminent in it uh, as marx had said in capitalism 
even the capitalist is capital personified. In other words, the capitalist is not doing things because he wants to do things, he's not doing things according to his own kind of, you know, pleasure, but he is doing things because he has driven to he is driven to do certain things, he is driven to accumulate. So everybody in a capitalist system, individual agents are all alienated, and as a result you have the system really being driven by an impersonal force. Uh, now the point is therefore, in that kind of a situation, a, re a return to the old community in the, against the onslaught of the imminent tendency of capitalism was always out. There was a period immediately after independence when you had the newly independent Indian state believing that it can actually put some restraints on capitalism and therefore you had a whole lot of measures not only for the revival of agriculture but also for let's say having reservations for hand loans, having, having a certain kind of protection for petty production but as we know with the uh, emergence of neoliberalism, the spontaneity of capitalism has got re-established and this in turn has obviously meant that once more we are witnessing uh, an onslaught on petty production uh, and therefore far from going back to the village community we are actually having a destruction of whatever remains of that, that village community or that regime of petty production which had characterized India before uh, the onslaught of colonialism. So, uh, obviously the Gandhian paradigm is something which is not really recreatable in my view in the new situation given the imminent tendencies of capitalism. You have to go forward and therefore one has to think in terms of uh, a new order in which capitalism is transcended for uh, through a worker-peasant alliance and going on to socialism. But, the question nonetheless remains, to what extent is the Gandhian vision still relevant? By Gandhian vision, I mean not that you go back or revive the old uh, uh, village community. But by Gandhian vision, I mean that unless some restrictions are placed on the pace of technological progress, you cannot overcome mass unemployment and poverty. I think most people would argue that if we are talking about socialistic, most people would argue that this, the answer to this question turns on the question of property relations. That if we are talking about a capitalist economy, then obviously in a capitalist economy you can't even have restrictions on the pace of technological progress. You can have restrictions on the pace of technological progress in a socialist economy, but the argument would be that in a socialist economy you don't need to have restrictions on the pace of technological progress. Why not? Because of the fact that any technological progress in socialism can always be used to reduce the hours of work to enlarge leisure. Now if you do that, even if the socialist economy inherits from capitalism mass unemployment, therefore there are huge labor reserves which need to be used up. Suppose you have technological progress, increasing labor productivity, then what you can always do is that it need not affect the number of people being employed, but it can only affect the number of hours that each is made to work for. So you can have an enlargement of leisure, but no reduction in employment because of technological progress, in which case the pace of transition to full employment remains unaffected no matter how high the rate of technological progress. So technological progress only reduces the number of hours of work, but not necessarily the number of persons working, because each person can work for a much smaller number of hours of work. So this has been the traditional argument as far as socialists are concerned, because of which it is said that a socialist economy, precisely because it can, it can uh, take advantage of technological progress in enlarging leisure, uh, a, a, a socialist economy does not need to put any restraints as far as technological progress or its pace is concerned, and that this is something which would not even stand in the way of the rate at which we progress towards full employment. Okay. 
But I believe that this conceptualization has something missing in it, and, and, and that arises for the following fact, that we always think of technological progress under socialism as occurring where, let's say, people, you know, labor productivity increases, therefore uh, you can produce the same amount with fewer people or with the same people you can produce larger and so on. But the point is that any such increase in labor productivity is also associated with a redeployment of labor. It's not as if where people are working in the same place, exactly in the same factory, they suddenly become twice as uh, uh, productive. They may, I mean, they, 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 there may be cases of that, but, but typically technological progress uh, implies a substantial redeployment of labor. It really implies shifting people from one place to another. And this is something which therefore implies necessarily a dislocation in people's lives. And it follows therefore that even as technological progress raises the leisure hours increases the scope for leisure. It also creates a certain dislocation, particularly if we are talking about a socialist economy which has not reached full employment with their substantial labor reserves. Imagine a person who is dislocated, who is unemployed, but on the other hand would get employed maybe over a period of time. If you have large amounts of unemployment, that person is not going to be very happy with, with, with being unemployed because, you know, while, 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 while it's true that leisure may be increasing for some, for society as a whole, but on the other hand, there are some people who would always be between jobs, who would be dislocated, who would therefore be at least transitionally unemployed and who knows there are going to be only transitionally unemployed. As physical human beings, you can remain unemployed for a long time. Now that being the case, there is always a cost to technological progress. If there's a cost to technological progress, then it is not simply a, a, a phenomenon that increases leisure hours, but it's a phenomenon for which a certain cost has to be paid. And that being the case, there has to be a certain judgment about wh whether the pace of technological progress should be rapid, how much it should be, and so on. Ideally, I would believe in a socialist economy that judgment must be made by the workers as a whole. But particularly these costs, as I said, are going to be quite high in a situation where there is already substantial unemployment and the economy is moving towards full employment. In such a world, therefore, having unrestricted technological progress would actually be strongly resisted by large segments of the working class. Therefore, I would suggest that even in a socialist economy, even assuming the entire benefits of technological progress are passed on to the workers, nonetheless there has to be some restriction on the pace of technological progress. That it is certainly true that if there are no restrictions on the pace of technological progress and those who are employed simply raise their real wages, in that case you're going to have a division within the working class between some who are very well off and others who remain unemployed. But even assuming that actually real wages don't rise, even assuming that employment in, in terms of persons does not change, uh, I mean the, the, the trajectory remains unaffected by technological progress, only leisure increases, nonetheless some restrictions have to be placed. Looking at it differently, there are, you know, even assuming that technological progress is not just being introduced under capitalist conditions, and we know what that means, a mass poverty and unemployment, even if technological progress is introduced in conditions of socialism where the benefits accrue to the workers, certainly even in such a case, you can see that it introduces a certain kind of dislocation because of which unrestrained technological progress still makes man subservient to the machine. In other words, I would say that the objective of introducing technological progress must be made secondary to the objective of building a new community. 
the building of the new community is something which is paramount and technological progress is something that must be introduced even in a socialist society but introduced in a manner that does not disrupt this objective of building a new community to the extent that actually even when the benefits of technological progress accrue to the workers nonetheless there is a degree of subservience of man to machine because men are then being made to be displaced from their existing occupations and so on uh, uh, it, it 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 does mean that actually it is nonetheless it 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 warrants a degree of restraint on technological progress interestingly the socialist countries who are probably the the former socialist countries were probably the only countries in modern times who have reached full employment have been countries which introduced restraints on technological progress a lot of the jokes about the quality of soviet goods being bad was really the other side of the fact that there was a restriction on the rate of tech of introduction of technological progress because of which these were economies which actually had labor shortage which is unthinkable in any modern capitalist economy and it's also interesting that in china for instance very similar ideas about restraining technological change or if you like using technology which can be considered obsolete lead from a certain point of view was favored by mao when he asked for uh, the production of backyard steel so the this idea that that unrestrained technological progress is something which uh, is inimical to the cause of human liberation is an idea which has been recognized elsewhere and gandhi i believe saw this idea and that is something which to my mind is indicative of remarkable prescience as well as insight thank you very much